Welcome or welcome back. This is Pairs Well, well with knitting. knitting. I am so excited to be here in Montreal with two gorgeous knitters from our community. We have Naomi and we have Steph. And we have the privilege of being at Espace Tricot today in Montreal. So of course we have to start this gorgeous little chit chat with what we're wearing. So Naomi, what are you wearing today? I am wearing a Stephanie Earp design. Um, this is the Baccarat Bank. I'm sorry, I'm awkwardly moving my coffee cup around. Let's get him out of the way. <laughs> Gotta have our coffee. Um, this is knit in Llama Tweed from Camera Rose. Um, one of our favorite sort of tweedy cozy yarns. It just sort of feels like a floppy sweatshirt vibe. We call it the pajama yarn. <laughs> yes, pretty much. And uh, it's what I wear when I can't get out of bed in the morning. You know, those days when like, you just don't know what to put on and that suddenly becomes like the dominating blocker to the whole rest <laughs> of your day. That's when I put on this sweater. It's so gorgeous. I love and the tweety bits. Like I don't know if it's showing up on camera, but the tweety bits yeah, are just so such a stunner. They're a lot of fun. They're just every color has the tweety bits, and they're all pretty consistent across the colors. So, although it's got all this bright contrast in the color work, the tweety nups are just consistently just neutral colors and I think that pulls any color work project together really nicely in this yarn. It's such a beautiful combination of all the colorways. I'm yeah. in love. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Steph, what are you wearing? Uh, I'm wearing also a Stephanie Earp design. Uh, this is the channel sweater and it's from uh, the book that Naomi and I published uh, and it's from the LYS. Uh, and so this is like a really simple top down drop shoulder sweater with a little bit of like a mock neck. Can you show the like yeah, the so, shoulder on this? this so is fabulous. Yeah, it's like um it increases like every round yes. until you get down here and there's like a little tiny textural detail pretty subtle. Um and this has uh this is Camaro's snuff nug but held with make it tweed, which is like one of my favorite discoveries. I have to admit, it's actually a customer sent us like a picture being like, will you get this? And I was like, yes, we will. <laughs> um, and so it's like a, a thread weight tweed yarn that you hold with other yarns. You wouldn't ever really knit it alone. It's literally like knitting with thread. But when you add it to things, it gives this like colorful pops of so tweedy as well. But then you can add it to yeah. anything. We didn't even coordinate. No, we didn't <laughs> it just turned it. up like this. Mondays are for <laughs> I wasn't tweed. a part of the tweed crew. I didn't know. <laughs> okay. But what are you wearing? Because I admired it as soon as you walked in. Why, thank you. Um, if you've been watching the episode of the, or sorry, the channel for a bit, this is the Wild Posy. This is a pullover mm. by Melody Hoffman. And it's a really simple texture, but lace color work yoke. Oh, a really simple. Simple sure. textural lace. Yes, yoke. not not color work. I'm I'm immersed <laughs> with all the color here, and it's two strands of Plutolope unspun mm. Istax yarn held double. And I've talked about it on end <laughs> on one of my other um, episodes. I'm in love. I wear it all the time. And quite frankly, if you check, check outside, which I'm also doing <laughs> footage from my Instagram, she's winter out here. So old man winter, this is keeping me cozy cozy. Do you find that knitting with the unspun is hard? Like I've heard sort of mixed reviews. I haven't tried it yet. No, I love it. Okay. I think, okay, unspun, it's, it's one of my absolute favorite types of yarn to work with. I think because it works up beautifully, it's really like... I like working double with it, so chunky. But as far as the easement or simplicity, I'm a really, like, these people know. I'm loosey-goosey <laughs> knitter, so we often have to go down a needle size okay. to obtain any kind of gauge. And so I'm okay. Like, I, I don't reef mm. at yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. spun. I okay. pull up from the plates. If you see me knitting with other kinds of yarn that has, like, twist, like, normal other, like, spun yarn... We aggressive knit. So like love my life will be sitting next to me on the couch and I'll be like whoosh. And I'll just like reef on that working yarn. But you can control it. Like you can adjust to the yarn you're working with. We we control okay. the aggressive knitting. <laughs> totally. It's, it is something that totally. we've wondered whether we should bring Maybe. in. Yeah. Because it is growing in popularity and being used by some really fantastic designers and beautiful patterns. Um, but I have tried three different brands at least. Mm -hmm. I've tried it held double, I've tried it with mohair, and I cannot knit it. Interesting. It just breaks. Yeah. And I think I would need to, I knit loosely as well, oh. but I think the way that I hold my yarn and the way that I draw yarn from the ball, um, I would just need to completely overhaul my muscle memory and my mm -hmm. habits to knit with that yarn, um, which is kind of a shame because I love the effect of it. I love rustic yarns and I, um, 
Mm, it's just, it looks, may I? Touch? Oh, we're <laughs> getting there. We're getting nice. there. Um, and I keep feeling like I should just try again. You know, a couple of years go by. It's been like, oh, it's been a while. Maybe this time. This is me and Lennon. Right? I keep doing it. Like, every couple of summers, yeah. I'm like, I, I'm sure I've gotten better. I can do this and <laughs> yeah. I can't. Oh. So, yeah, we've, we, we, I did knit a pattern that was written for Plotilopi held double, or at least an Unspanyan oh, cool, held yeah. double, yeah. the Donna Jenna um, sweater by Joanna Ang. And I love it. And I used a spun yarn. I yeah. had to. Um, which completely changes the vibe of the fabric. Yeah. It's a lot rounder, a lot cleaner. It doesn't have that beautiful halo to it. But it is it is a way of, of playing around and realizing how many different different yarns you can use for any different pattern. Like you know, Okay, you are preaching to my heart <laughs> right now, Naomi. This is my whole love of knitting is that I love taking a pattern. I have my heart set on some kind of yarn. This is like naughty, like 2023 pairs old knitting Jennifer. And I would go, I would go into it. I would choose always a yarn that wasn't recommended for the pattern. So I call myself the naughty knitter. <laughs> <laughs> but this is one of, I'd say definitely one of the first patterns that I took the recommended yarn. Mm -hmm. I actually did a gaze swatch. This is my 2024 knitting intentions success this is i think my best fitting sweater Fantastic. i don't know and i you know preaching yeah. the choir about the unspun or not it's taking i think methodically going through that knitting process mm -hmm. so maybe if we let's like diverge into knitting process shall okay. we yeah shall yeah, we? yeah 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 fascinating okay could you tell me and all of us lovelies what you would define your knitting process to be how okay do you want me do you want me to give you what i yeah, yeah give me some parameters process. okay yeah. yeah so before 2024 i i just i would go rogue i was the naughty knitter i would i would look at a pattern i would purchase yarn i purchased yarn kind of with the idea of like sweater quantity yarn but i never i wouldn't i wouldn't i would go yarn first for like my love of like squish factor and like fall in love be swayed by the yarn and then I would find a pattern that I was like, oh, this would look stunning in this match. Like this would pair well together, visually speaking. Um, gauge swatch or not, I would do it. Sometimes I wouldn't, and but it would it would end up where I would have to be a mathematician and recalculate for the entire pattern. There was always a lot of ripping out, which I think in hindsight really allowed me to understand construction of garments massively <laughs> and way more than if I had to just follow pattern. Um, so I realized I wanted to make my life better because we're knitting because we love it. This is a passion of ours and it brings us great joy. And so how can we make it more joyful? So I analyzed my whole process. 2024, we did like a reverse unlearn where now I'm starting with a gauge watch, <laughs> being a responsible knitter. And from my gauge swatch, I am searching to see what actually matches with gauge. This is not revolutionary for a lot of people, but for this girl, massive. And then would kind of allow me to pick out my pattern. And so yeah. far, success. So this, I this think is I'm my like, process. I'm like 2023 20, you most of the time. Oh. Um, I get swept away by an idea and I want it on my needles <clears throat> ASAP. Um, and we'll like start casting stuff on without a gauge swatch. So I'm like measuring, you know, I've got an inch knit and I'm like, hmm, oh, this is going to be a reliable <laughs> indicator <laughs> so much. of uh, what's going to happen. And, you know, I, I've been knitting long enough and I have enough experience, I think. And a lot of the yarns I've knit with before, right, because we're yarn store owners. So it's not like I'm, I'm not doing as much as I used to before I was a yarn store owner picking things off a shelf that I've never worked with before. I know these yarns really well. I often know what my gauge was, or I have an old project, right, that I've done in it that I can kind of be like, well, I think I'm going to get about 20. Almost always getting about 20, to be honest. Like, okay. I'm such a weird knitter. I can take number. any yarn in the store and get 20. <laughs> That's um, so I think I do that. Yeah. Um, and I have more success with that probably than I should. And it's like a very much a do what I say, not what I do. My recommendation when people come into the store is definitely like do a gauge swatch or, or work with a yarn you know, where maybe you have that information already from a previous project. It's just a difficulty level, like you discovered, right? It's like, if you don't mind sitting here and recalculating yeah. and making you know m mods on the fly mm -hmm. and trying things on constantly, 
great, then do whatever you want. Okay. But if you want to make it easy for yourself, yeah, look at the recommended yarn, read through the whole pattern before you begin, <laughs> do a good ga- and a good gauge swatch for it. Like you like- also pick up and do a little ribbing to make sure that's also going to work. Okay, girl, All of is, that. This, is this actually your process though? Or is this I like do what both. we should do? I okay. do both. I have done it that way. And okay. especially if I'm especially if I'm doing a design and it's going to be complicated, mm-hmm. I'll start there to try it. Because I've learned the hard way. Like exactly what you're saying. Of like, I, I don't want to get 50% of the way in and go like, this is not possible. I've wasted this time. Yeah. My time feels more valuable, especially as like it being part of the business. That I can't waste time like that. Absolutely. Yep. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. What yeah, about you? I have <laughs> uh, a couple different approaches because I knit and we both knit a lot for the store. I'm maybe more of the person who knits the actual patterns for the store. And then you're I turn doing to design. A lot, of, a lot of design work or you're you're playing around mm-hmm. a lot, which I like to do too, but I'm not a I I don't play with swatches. I get bored by swatching. I'll knit a gauge swatch if, especially if it's going to be something for the store because I want to be able to either follow it exactly as the pattern is written so that I can tell people this is exactly how the pattern's written. Or um, if I am going to do any kind of modifications, I want to be able to clearly keep track of them and communicate them so that somebody else can replicate that. Because we do get emails like, I want to do it exactly like you did. And I have to go back through and like, oh, okay, okay, I added three colors into this chart that was originally (laughs) for four colors and I made it seven and then I steeped it. I don't know. (laughs) Um, So when I'm knitting for myself, I'm a little bit more 2024 Jennifer. Mm, I, I love... I start with a yarn often yeah um and I knit it maybe I try a couple different needle sizes and I feel where it wants to be and where I really like it yeah and then I work backwards from that swatch into pattern searching and so one of my favorite features of Ravelry which is hidden down in the additional filters all the way at the bottom is filter by gauge so if I'm knitting with a DK yarn I don't click the DK category in the yarns I find where I want to knit it and I search by that gauge. Like 23 stitches. 23 stitches, or maybe a range like 22 to 23. <clears throat> um, and then you're finding patterns that are stranded, you're finding patterns that are maybe fingering weight knit super loosely, more loose, loosely than I like, or worsted weight more tightly than I like. Um, but you're starting from the point of knowing that you're gonna like the fabric because you have it in front of you and you felt it and you've enjoyed knitting it and you know that it's going to give you the fabric that you want. Now, let's find what shape to put that fabric into. I adore that you shared this little like <laughs> tidbit of, you know, going down on the what is that? That's the, the left, filter. Yes, yeah. The left filter. side filter. It's all the way down at the yeah. bottom and to get there quickly, I do like control F to find text on the page. I go control F gauge. <laughs> <laughs> and they also has it by But it what's weird is it has it by inches mm. or by or centimeters. centimeters. So and I just use the inches one. Yeah, cuz I think most of the patterns are listed yeah. that way. Yeah. Uh, but Oh, you do centimeter? I do. Yeah, but I think probably there's something Just for filtering there. purposes. But yeah, and also, I don't know if you know this. You, you can, can do or. You, you can, can also or. drag um, <laughs> stuff in that menu yeah. around. It, it resets back to the bottom, but if mm, you right. are in the middle of doing lots of searching, you can drag the ones you're interested in to the top. Yeah. And they stay there for a bit. This is so good. I it's feel... Cool. This is something that I feel like as someone who constantly wants to like grow and learn talking about process and knowing for me I don't know about you know for other people but being open to allowing that process to grow Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. me and be flux with it yeah and it's it's really fun talking about it and we get to do that a lot with customers but then it also just really helps me kind of come back and focus on how I like to work and to use my time efficiently because we have this very different and very privileged position of being surrounded by all this yarn that we can just grab at any moment. We have a massive Mm -hmm. bin of leftovers, so we're not breaking into new stock. And we have people to talk about this with all day because it's our jobs. And a lot of our job is knitting. Like I sometimes feel guilty knitting at work and then I'm like, oh no, it's your job. This is important. Uh, This is the time you have to do it. Um, So it's it's definitely allowed me to reflect a lot more on that than I did when I was just sort of maybe working here one day a week but not really having knitting be my whole life um which is how I started at the store um yeah it's just I I still make flops with my project decisions yeah cast on too many I don't have that restraint of like (laughs) I don't have that restraint of I'm gonna do one 
project because I have limited time. <laughs> it's sort of the flip side I, of it. I think that's probably one of like the yeah. big myths about like, oh, well, you're you know, you're a really experienced knitter, and you know you've been doing this for twenty years, and you're at a professional level, so you must never have flops or make mistakes. When in fact, you have more of them. But maybe you know to abandon them sooner. Or is it because we're willing to take the risk? Like take I, th- the chance, I think there's parts think? of that yeah, as yeah. well. But I also think like we don't make podcast episodes about the stuff that we get this far into and are like <laughs> then toss, so right? Yes, but it I happens do. to us too. <laughs> I, do. I did a whip parade and <laughs> she was a, a very honest parade. A pretty and you know we should, we should consider a whip parade. That's a fun idea. Be, that is a, fun, a really fun, fun idea. idea. We might idea. be like TM pairs it. with knitting, we're doing a whip parade. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Whip parade. Um, so not whips. We're going to go flip side. We're going to go finish objects. Mm-hmm. I, first of all, knitting m- brings us joy. It is a passion that we fulfill by making fabric with our hands that we actually get to showcase on our bodies or, you know, other people's bodies. Um, what is your absolute favorite thing that you've ever did? Actually, um, it goes way back, and I still have it. It's a, it's hanging on the back of the bathroom door right now. It's um, the Ulma Shawl by Kristen Kapoor. It is probably the oldest finished object that I have ever made that I still have. Should I grab it while you're chatting about it? You could. It's Shush. okay. So it's okay. Um, you chat. You do your thing. It's on the on the wall. It's like a, a striped shawl. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it's not a complicated pattern. I think I made a mistake in it as well, but it's probably. The first time I really felt kind of like, oh, wow, I made exactly what I wanted. And it's hand-dyed, fancy yarn. You know, at that point in my knitting career, this was a huge investment to buy. I think it was three skeins of hand-dyed yarn. Um, And it has this beautiful lace border, which was really like, it was a real stretch for me at the time. Yeah. But what, it's just, and I, I mean, it has to be 15 or years old now. And I still have it. And like... Look at this. I got to do some repair. (laughs) But like just, you know, I'll find that while I'm walking and wearing it. And I'll be like, well, I'll just tie a quick knot. Like, I don't know. It's like, it's not precious. It's it's a staple. And not all of my knits have become that. Sometimes like, because I like to mess around with lace and color work and all kinds of, and and pushing myself, sometimes stuff is too delicate that I like to make. Or it doesn't feel everyday enough to, to become like part of my everyday routine. And this does. And I just remember how I felt when I made it. Uh, This is beautiful. And it has a history. Yes. I love that. And this is a color called Archangel. It's a Malabrigo color that um, it just like, my friend Diana says like, when you really love a color, you almost want to bite it. (laughs) That's how I feel about this color. But this, I can tell this one is faded. That's how old it is. It doesn't look like it anymore. Um, but that's like how long it's been in my life. Anyway, so I that's love it. That's so lovely. I love it. Thank you. It's so good. Naomi, how about you? Well, I wore this sweater in part because it is absolutely one of my favorite mm-hmm. things I've ever knit. I knit it quite soon after taking over with staff of ownership here back in 2021. And you had redone this design in Lama Tweed from a previous pattern of yours. Yeah. Which is very, very similar. You just shifted it up into different colors because the yeah. first version used a color changing yarn. Is that right? It, yeah, it just had a totally different yeah. breakdown of where the colors were. And the gauge were. was different yeah. and everything. Um, but it just, the palette really came together well for going off piste from the colors originally used in, in a color work. I love knitting color work. I have been doing it for a long time. But this was at the point where I was sort of just starting to change up palettes so significantly from what an original pattern did and um it worked and it was super satisfying and it's super comfy well and also i have one too that has a light color base Mm -hmm. and then we would we would twin Ah. together and i think it was like yeah it was kind of like a key moment in our relationship as store owners together and friends i've knit designs of yours before but this was like the most successful yeah outcome and i also brought because sort of speaking to that same thing that steph mentioned of being satisfied and fulfilled by by the skill of something i've not really ever worn this i've modeled it it stayed in the store i haven't it never became part of my wardrobe it might one day but it works really well in the store but the point of this one was really as you say just for the joy of actually knitting it and where is this this is the scout mini shawl by florence sperling i just got distracted by a little 
one strand that's pulled, but I'll fix that later. <laughs> um, so gorgeous. This is a mix of Fair Isle and Intasha, and it was basically the second Intasha project I'd done. Um, and as I was working through it, I was just like, I can't believe I can do this. And I can't believe it's still working. <laughs> and so it, I'm usually, when we were talking about process, I don't know if you've ever talked on your podcast about process knitting and product knitting as a concept. Um, I'm very much usually a product knitter. I love the process of actually knitting, but I kind of just get through it as quickly as possible because eyes on the prize, I want to wear this thing. Interesting. This is the one time I have been a process knitter. You slowed down. I, I, I had to because it's in Tasha and yeah. Meryl. Yes. <laughs> and I had, it took me a long time because I was making it in February and basically every t all the hours of the day that I was home were dark. Um, and I had to do it in the light and I had five yarns all around me because that's sort of the easiest way to do in Tasha. This never traveled with me it took a lot longer than something this size usually would. And all of that just came together to be like, it's this is one of the things beautiful. I am the most <laughs> proud of. And it brings me closest to the generations in my family who knit because they would do things like this. <laughs> and <laughs> this yeah. is too side. beautiful. Yeah, you should see the wrong side. Like, like, look how tidy. It's so good. And it's beautiful. so satisfying. Oh, and it's an incredibly written pattern. And I don't think anybody should be put off by thinking it's too difficult. It's if you just keep in mind that it's just breaking it down into knits and pearls and there is color work pearling is. but i don't think you should think that you can't do color work pearl you totally can it's a slightly different motion you do yeah. have to slow down but i think that we can get too caught up in, in what especially the internet tells you you can't do in knitting this is okay. seeming <laughs> color work pearl like color work flat color work flat rather yeah um yeah or in Tarsia, in Intarsia the round in the is round. the other one. Yes, yeah. you can do Intarsia in the round. And we see beautiful projects that our customers bring in just because nobody's told them that they can't do it. Yeah. And Love I think it. we get really wrapped up in the idea that something's like too, too difficult. There were so many amazing pieces that you brought forward. So you're talking about, so first, like, <laughs> knitting. <laughs> no, it's fabulous. I love it. It's, it's bringing in memory from our hands and our experiences that we get to relive, I feel, every time we reach for that thing, that accessory, that garment, whatever. Never mind, we haven't even talked about gift knitting. I don't know, <laughs> I'm a selfish knitter, so maybe we will go More there. so that for me too. Okay, good. Um, I, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, but as well, like process, product knitting, and slowing down. And I mean, this is, this is what we've shared. I won't, I won't get into the whole test knitting bit yet. We will in pattern design, which is thrilling, and I'm so jazzed to be talking about that in a moment too. But we're, we are making our own fabric from string, essentially. Like, it, it, it still blows my mind, even though we do this for four years, obviously combined, you know, we're, we're in it for decades here. We're, it is a slow process. And I feel like in knitting communities, sometimes there is that concept of product, which nothing wrong. We want the thing. It's gorgeous. We're happy. We're proud to wear it. But sometimes like allowing ourselves to realize, let's slow down. We're building our own fabric from needles. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely That's think both amazing. approaches are, are valid and like mm -hmm. no one is better than the other. And absolutely. Every knitter probably goes through phases of being one or the other or like for this, at this I think at the same time I was doing this I was knitting a top down raglan in like two weeks or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, and just banging There's always a bit of both at, at the same time. I love it. I think it is totally valid to be focused on the finished product because that will bring you motivation and fulfillment and being able to wear something out into the world um, is yes. super exciting. I, okay, I mean, we could talk for five hours. I have to try to like <laughs> my my love of what's coming out of this. So first of all, okay, let's talk about product process. You said Naomi, it's a mix, right? Steph, you didn't really talk about product process. I would say I'm probably a product knitter. Like I'm very motivated by that end result of having the thing yeah. and wanting the thing. Um, but I think if I if I actually get down to it, then then I would make much simpler things than I do. I'm I'm I like to push myself. I like a challenge, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> whether that's like math and designy. But even sometimes with just like stitches, like I like to try something different. So it's you know if I try to knit stockinette in the round after eight p.m., like I fall asleep. Right. Yeah. I find it like really too lulling, and I know a lot of people are in it for that that relaxation. Whereas I'm like opposite. I'm I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I want my brain to be engaged. 
So I think if I'm, if I really get underneath it, Mm -hmm. I'm probably more process driven than I realize. Um, But I am like what keeps me going and keeps, you know, because you do the stitch a few times, you're like, great, (laughs) that was fun to come up with. But to finish the prop, to finish it, that's because I want to wear it. And I admit, like, I love the compliments. I love the, oh my God, you made that. (laughs) I love that. It's such a great feeling. Of course. Okay. Oh, okay. (laughs) I just feel like I'm like, I want to talk about everything. Um, so memory, can we talk about knitting memories in? I feel for me, part of the podcast is knitting, yarny adventures, and travel. And so for me, especially being on sabbatical this year, which I feel so lucky, delighted, and now I'm on the, the second leg before we go back into <laughs> real life. Um, I really feel like because when I am knitting, I'm quite mindful. Even if I'm doing other things at the same time, I think we are often... You know, we are this the special people that can do multiple things at one time, perhaps not perfectly, but we have to keep our brains active. Um, traveling and knitting is my absolute favorite combination. Absolute. So I have full garments. This is an example of the entire thing, cast on and cast off in Mexico. This was a whole month in Mexico. Some people are like, how did you, you knit that it? in that heat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally cool. I had the plates of Plutlopi on me with a bikini on my skin. Amazing. Totally fine. This to me represents that entire time in Mexico, which was just stunning with the love of my life. What about you with travel? How do you travel with your knitting? I- I'm exactly the same. Okay. Whatever I'm knitting on a journey, I put a huge amount of thought into what I take on yes. meaningful trips because I know that it will always have that meaning to me and remind me of that time and I've had some incredibly meaningful moments knitting that knitting has has created for me while traveling I was um back in the UK um for the first time in I think two two and a half plus years uh, after COVID and I hadn't been home to see my family and um I was super emotional I got back for like a week of course it wasn't long enough never is And I was, and the the interesting thing is that I actually don't remember what I was knitting during this interaction, but I was knitting something in the lounge of the Newcastle airport and a lady comes up to me and in an American accent, very unusual to hear in the Newcastle airport, but she was like, oh, you're you're knitting, what are you knitting? And I was not in the mood. I just (laughs) said goodbye to my mum. I was like trying to hold back tears. I was masked at least. I'm kind of like almost welling up even remembering it. And... Uh, so I was at the point of like pretending that I didn't understand English, like <laughs> which I do sometimes, um, and just being like sorry, <laughs> pulling out the French. Um, but she kept at it, and she sat down, and I took out my headphones, and um, she started talking about how she was knitting the um, shawlography, the West Knits middle, mystery knit along from that year, and I was sort of drawn into conversation and she just pulled me out of my funk like oh. in such in a really beautiful way and I don't know if she even realized that she was doing this um I didn't get all emotional and thank her for it or anything I just said thank you for the lovely chat at the end or something we both went our separate ways we weren't on the same plane or whatever and she did tell me her name and I had said I'd just taken over a yarn store and we got into it and like she was from the state somewhere and um I've just thought ever since I should knit a shawlography <laughs> <laughs> But you remember this conversation. I remember this conversation, and I don't, and I remember what she was knitting, but not what I was knitting. Um, and that was just like, I don't know. I would have just continued feeling miserable that whole day, probably, if that hadn't happened. Maybe. Yeah, I know that. I've I mean, heard that story. I, love that's that's lovely. I didn't tell you that when mm-hmm. I came back. Oh, that that's gonna bring us into knitting community. That's <laughs> yeah. so lovely. Thank you yeah. for sharing. Of course. Steph, what about you with travel and knitting? Well, I was thinking when you said I don't remember what I was knitting, I was like, that's it. Like I. Obviously, I travel with my knitting, and it's a big part of it, but I realized that, you know, after a few years, I actually don't remember mm-hmm. the trip associated necessarily with that piece. And I might remember I was I was traveling when I made it, mm-hmm. but I won't necessarily know where I was or think of a certain trip and a certain knit. Mm-hmm. But I do always remember where I bought yarn. Okay. That's where it, it gets embedded with travel for me. So, like, yeah. you know, and sometimes it'll be years before I return to that skein and finally figure out what I'm going to do with it. 
And that's when it comes flooding back of, oh, I was in Nova Scotia with this group of friends and they were so kind to come to the yarn store with me. And I remember this friend had a great <laughs> chat with the yarn store owner while I was picking my yarn. Or like I, Those memories will come flooding back with the yarn itself. And then what you were saying about the baccarat, the sweater mm-hmm. that like when we wore it together, where we were in our lives, mm-hmm. I think that about the folly skirt too. Mm-hmm. The folly skirt was like the first design I did really as a yarn store owner. And every time I put that skirt on, I think about those days. So I think for me, it's connected more to the object and to the yarn than the actual act of being away. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I love hearing this because it it is like three knitters, all, you know, different skill levels, all different, you know, experiences in life and really different connection with knitting and travel and then the yarn. Like, this is great. Okay. Okay. Oh, so good. So knitting community now, because I feel Naomi brought brought that whole world up. How would you... Okay, I'm going to start. I'll preface with, for me... Yeah, how did you find your way in? Well, okay. (laughs) Let me tell you, because this is the trouble. I could talk about myself for the whole thing, but let's let's incorporate everyone. With knitting for me, I I felt like I was one-man band. My friends, dear, they're, they're my chosen family for me nobody's a knitter and so I really felt like and I'm I'm very much a people person I classify myself if I had to put myself in a silo an extrovert I feed off of the energy of people when I go have coffee with girlfriends and I come back home I'm jazzed I'm energized I'm ready like go on a run or whatever um which may be not true for typical knitters I think the story of the sort of introverted knitter is maybe yes. more uh, common, but I've met it's a lot of like people totally like us. Totally true. Yeah. Totally true. So fair. Um, but I was craving that community piece. I, I wanted something in person. And of course, I got into knitting, ironically, you know, six, eight months right before pandemic times. Most people became, I think, the knitter in pandemic. I was right before. So I was really craving that in person. I, I would have regardless. Um, so once we kind of, you know, got free again, trying to figure out where where are my knitting friends? Who can I become friends with? And so for me, I've, I've slowly started with a knit night in, in Toronto, which is so gorgeous. And the people are just <laughs> the loveliest, warmest humans ever. Um, going to knitting shops and chatting with people, which is so lovely. Um, Toronto, I was saying in another podcast of mine that not, you know, going out, I like chatting in general to people, like at even a cafe, I'll bring up conversation. And sometimes it's not always the warmest receival. (laughs) Um, Because, you know, people are in their own little bubble and to be interrupted, that's a big deal. Um, But it's, it's things like this that I feel like I have such the luxury of time on my side, but then as well, very warm knitters as well that accept the time together because I feel like every little ounce I get of interaction and online as well, I mean, I also, the comments from people are the nicest. I feel that's all, you know, manifesting to this gorgeous knitting community that I feel I've become a part of. And I feel that was the thing with the podcast and kind of part of that subconscious need that I didn't know I needed was building the community or becoming a part of. And so now I feel like I'm like, in a nice way to say, like melting in to the knitting community. So, okay. So, okay. yes. Okay. That's a lot. No, <laughs> so but I, I told think, you. Try to I'm, I'm kind of like thinking back to myself at the beginning of my knitting journey and that I didn't do that reaching out and looking for community okay. uh, for mm-hmm. a long time. It really was like my weird little hobby. Like in, in the dark? Like no, I mean, of... people knew. Like my <laughs> okay. friends knew that I did it. But again, like I was never ever thinking that I would convince any of my friends to do it too. Like I never offered to teach them and I didn't expect them to be interested. Right. I didn't, you know, I kind of knew that like at that time it was like Stitch and Bitch was the name yes. for that. And I, I knew yes. that existed because the, the, the book had come out with that. Mm-hmm. So there was this idea of like, especially around the kind of like Riot Girl, Whoa. Stitch and Bitch stuff Stitchy. happening around music. Um, but I never... I never considered going and joining up with that. I was like, you know, I was like too cool to be a joiner, I guess. You know, I was like, I don't need that. And then, but then I would go to yarn stores and I would also be like too cool to ask questions. So I did a lot of stumbling in the dark of like, you know, reading the backs of knitting magazines and looking at the library and then, you know, being like, 
I'm looking for the real and concealed haze and I refuse to ask where it is. Um, and now I think that I think about how we approach our customers here. <laughs> I guess if it had been me, I would have been like, Shh, leave me alone. Um, because we're very engaged in conversation. And I'm so glad that I found it, but it took me a really long time to be interested in like having knitting being a social thing. I still struggle with it, honestly. I think that part of like what I like to knit is so complex that I often like, if it's knit night, I don't knit. It's too hard to do both. Um, Cause I'm looking for those knits that like shut the chatter in my brain mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. So they need to be hard. Um, but I'm so glad, like what Naomi was talking about, like just the amount of conversation I get to have about design, about stitch work, about yarn, about where this all comes from, what am I trying to achieve, to have people who understand why that's an interesting thing to talk about and also think it's fascinating is such a boon. And I'm so glad that I have it in my life. That's really lovely. Yeah, it was so good. For me, it was when I, we started, when I started working at a store that I really became involved in all of that. I didn't know that there really were knit nights. I came to, like I would visit stores around Montreal, some of which are still here, some of which aren't, but I never really knew that you could also go there and just hang out. I thought like I I had to, I went when I got my tax refund back, because that would be the only time I'd be able to afford like to, to buy real yarn. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember the first, the first thing I bought here was, uh, uh, wool and silk blend with uh, with some tax refund money. Um, <laughs> but in in school, my friends and I got into crochet, and it was the beginning of mm. not even really that stuff on YouTube, but like photo tutorials or even just like pictures, and you try to recreate it. And we'd be making um, amigurumi and things. And but knitting was always pretty solitary. I didn't have a huge amount of other friends who did it. Like some people could. I remember meeting someone at a party who said she worked at the yarn store. I said, you can do that? (laughs) I didn't know you can work at yarn stores. I was just like hypnotized by this charmed life that this this other lady must lead. And I think she might have been referring to either here or or a place nearby that was Mm. closed, that's since closed because she said it was out west. Um, But really the deep dive happened almost overnight when I started working here one Saturday a week and suddenly I was like wow there's so much to talk about and so much to learn and I'm seeing the same people come by like every week or every couple of weeks and um yeah just and then you get involved to... in their project yeah in a way exactly that... like how's that going yeah or, yeah so that I think my community really started with customers and always always kind yeah. of has been but then now we've got this community around our staff as yeah. well right so there's there's conversations that happen like while we're opening the store in the morning before we before the doors open, right? That's show and tell time. Oh, God, look, look at what I did last night. Like, what, do you, you know, what do you think I should doing? do? Do you How's think I should, you know, yeah. oof, this increased. Is there another option? Or, oh, look, my bind off's funny. And that little, like those little moments of skill sharing and, and getting someone else's opinion on what you're working on is amazing. Like, and you can get that at night and you get that in all kinds of different ways. But I think for us, that's, that's the one where like we are nerding yeah. out hard and if I try to do that at home or with my friends you know they're gonna be like I don't know what you're talking about but I have this community of people where I can be like should I do a left leaning increase a lifted <laughs> increase should I be yeah. doing a slip slip knit with a slip pro wise or knit wise like there's not a lot of people mm-hmm. that want to have that conversation you know I I also feel it's nerding out and I get to as well with the podcast and Instagram and just the most gorgeous community but yeah, it's the nerding out piece. I just, I love, I feel like it's like knitting out. Like, is it yeah. nerd? No, yeah. it's like knitting. Well, knitting it's like, it's that, it's that insider stuff yeah. that's beyond the like, oh, that's a nice sweater or you picked out a pretty colorway yeah. that gets into like how we construct things. I imagine woodworkers do it. Oh, I like and that join. You know, it's still. like, yeah. And then it's, it's passing little bits of information that come from experience and from having it in front of you and seeing it that I think is like I could never get that from books and magazines I wanted I was looking for it there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I didn't find it until I had a community and it's totally that sort of thing that sort of approach to problem solving and um working out puzzles and also fabric the fabric that we're making from our hands it's changed my perspective on how I go out and about in the world and that's like maybe a really big (laughs) statement but in terms of just like um like shopping for clothes I, I, if I go thrifting with friends, I'm that person who's like looking at the seams and like looking at the in there and like looking at the fabric content and like you should get this. I'm like, nah, nah, nah it's not it worth it. Rayon in it. Yeah. No. Um, oh, no. And just the satisfaction I get from kind of it feels like I finally have 
um, a subject specialism. Yeah, an expertise. An expertise, yeah. a field of expertise. Mm-hmm. Like every when I'm among people I like who I'm nerding out about it with knitting I out knitting mm-hmm. out with and I don't quite realize it but when sometimes there'll be occasions when I'm out shopping with friends or just like watching a movie or something with my partner and just like I realize like oh not everybody knows this it's not general information yeah. now, not at all yeah and it feels like it feels just like it's wrong to say that I take pride in anything because you know we're always absolutely yeah I think <laughs> right? it's worth yeah it's yeah. worth taking pride in the fact that you have this this uh field of expertise around something I love it yeah let's talk about the pride piece and the community piece because my heart I I met Stephanie and Naomi sorry Steph I know <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, and Naomi up at the knitting loft two three months ago it was January oh, January yeah. okay uh, beginning of January about two months ago okay yeah. so out of winter um knitting loft gorgeous um knit shop in toronto north of toronto good little subway ride for me these girls came from montreal um i met you at the shop because you were there talking about your knits from the lys this is a gorgeous knitting book that was published in december i believe yes yes of of 2023 and I feel for me, and I want to talk about all about this, this hones in the community piece with, obviously, we would talk this massive link of community with our local yarn shop. This is the most perfect title, I feel. <laughs> Thank you. That just goes again with this whole theme of, of us. And I feel like we're really probably representative of like the trifecta of knitters this is community it is and also like you know when we first pitched it it was a little loosey-goosey of what we were doing but as it came together it really did become that where like every piece in the book was knit by someone who works here or worked here at some point the models used to work here and moved on into other parts of their life one has become a knitwear designer one is pursuing art um you know it's just like and then it's you know designs from naomi and i but also from our staff and our teachers so there's this real sense of like, it's all from inside this little, you know, 1200 square foot space, all of this came out of it. And then we also even as a design sort of prompt was like, what are the designs that our customers asked about? What do they tell us they want to knit? Um, you know, so in some cases, like they're re- some things are really advanced and tough for those people who are like, I want to challenge, I want to show off knit. And then there's stuff that's super simple, or shapes that people have been like, oh, is there anything that's kind of like, I don't like having all this fabric up by, ne- by my neck. When one of our designers took that as a like a leaping off point to come up with a shawl shape that would answer that question. So I think the fact that like at, at heart, like these interactions with our customers and with each other is what drove the whole <laughs> design process of the book. And yeah, I mean, obviously we're really, we're thrilled with it. And I still kind of can't believe that we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and the... What's been absolutely thrilling about it too, in a way that we were a little bit, not nervous pitching it, but just sort of like wondering how it would be received, is a store writing a book that other stores, are they going to sell it? Are they going to get behind it? Like, will they want it? Will they want it? Will they think it's competition? And there has just been this overwhelmingly open and encouraging and supportive and joyful response from other local yarn stores, LYSs, to carrying this book. And that was like so thrilling for us and just sort of proof of what we hoped, but what we were maybe a little too nervous to be confident about in that um, businesses are supporting businesses and open to their ideas and open to their projects. And um, just this sort of, I mean, I don't want to say a lack of competition because we all have to be competitive in in our own ways to remain in business these days, but not competitive against each other. Yeah. That's um, really nicely yeah. said. That's so nicely said. Yeah, and the fact that yeah. the Knitting Loft invited us to come yeah. and hosted us, and it was it was magical. And yeah, yeah, it really like that's one of those things where like I have the yarn I bought when we were there. Yeah, and that's a project that when it's finished, I will put it on and yeah. I will remember that trip, and it will mean a, a lot to me. And like, yeah. thinking about like even our journey as business owners, mm-hmm. like that was a key moment of like, okay, we're out in the world, mm-hmm. we're outside the walls of our store. Mm-hmm now into us another community yeah 
that's welcoming us in. Yeah, Bruna and Maria, who are they're the welcome. owners, they're a mother-daughter um, ownership of the store. They're just the warmest. So and wonderful. I feel like this, this yeah. is it. I feel, you know, I, I've talked to other podcasters outside of Knitting World, and they're like, oh, these comments that I'm getting, you know, can be really challenging. And I'm like, girl, like, <laughs> I feel like this is it. This is Knitting Community. And I love that piece of bringing each other up. Like yeah. that, that is so important as humans, I think in general, and a piece of that humanity, which, you know, that's part of my journey this year, along with growth and we won't bore you with the personal, <laughs> um, but it's so nice to hear that this is kind of like your drive as well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know if it's somewhat beside the point I think is part of is that you've taken essentially people's desires and requests feedback which I feel is massively important to produce this beautiful collaboration as a book but I feel like it's representative I mean we're knitters like it's rep representative of so many things of like love community passion joy Thank well I you. think you you've gotten at something too that like collaboration like we think about film right film is always collaborative almost always right like you see that list of credits and you know, in, in frequently you're like, I can't believe how many people it took to make this, right? And I think in some, in a much more sort of miniaturized way, knitting has some of that same thing. Like if you're knitting from a pattern and that pattern designer is out there, but then there's also the yarn that they used and like the story of that, that yarn company, which is probably small. Like even the big ones are pretty small. Absolutely. And yeah. then you have like the test knitters that it might be in that mix and you've seen their projects and you've looked at how they've interpreted it. And then there's the tech editor who has this expertise and has maybe affected the way it's written. And then you sit down to make it, you are in collaboration with those people whether you want to be or not, in a way, you know what I mean? Like whether you think of it that way or not, you are in an act of collaboration with, an, with another artist. It's a dance. And I think that there's something really magical about that. And that's been a newer revelation to <clears> me, I think. Part of doing the book, it really brought that home for me. Oh, okay. I, I want it because I'm seeing so many <laughs> samples that I just want to like squish and touch and feel. Would you like to share a couple of your favorites or maybe an interesting story? Yeah. It's, it's how you wish to go around it. Um, because they're just, they're so delightful. Who wants to go first to show one of the gorgeous knits from the knits from the local yarn shop? Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready? Okay. Go for it. And I'll be quick. Just talking about that idea of collaboration. Um, I thought I would show this skirt. It's called broderie, which is just French for embroidery. Here, I'm going to hold it while you chat about it. Um, and the reason I thought I would bring it up is that it actually was a collaboration where I invited Carolyn Bloom, um, who is an amazing designer of embroidery on knits as well. Like it's one of her specialties. And I knew I had this idea of like wanting to put embroidery on a skirt. Um, and I thought, well, why mess around? Like get the best person to do that. So we were kind of like the postal service, you know, we were sending each other swatches back and forth. Um, to try and figure out what we were going to do. And the pleat was really her idea of like creating a space for the embroidery to live. I had originally been thinking it would be something along the hemline. But what was really nice was this sense of like, I think Carolyn could have approached it like, yeah, yeah, sure, here's a, here's a chart. But she didn't. She really was like, well, let's keep talking about shape. Let's keep talking about why embroidery, why with a skirt. And it was really great for me to have that push, to have somebody ask me questions to go well why do you want to do it that way and go like oh I don't know I guess um I should think more about this so in the end the piece we have I feel is incredibly thoughtful in terms of how it fits and where the embroidery lives and why it looks the way it does and the yarns that we chose the colors and it was just yeah it was really really cool to like have that back and forth with another designer whose work I really admire Okay, this is where like the artsy girl comes in and trust me, I'm a science girl, but I've, I'm growing into my arts love is that you're talking about the collaboration of the skirt and the design. And if we think about even this piece of embroidery with knit, that's a collaboration on fabric. Yeah. It's just so stunning. And I wish again, you know, this was like a, 
you were able to touch with me it's just so sensually pleasing as well well and also like the the main yarn is quite rustic it's an untreated merino Absolutely. with a little bit of crunch mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. it's like this super soft alpaca blown yarn for the embroidery that creates this sort of is fuzzy the halo camera that's snuff the camera snuff nug yeah i know my yarn <laughs> yeah it's so good yeah that's hard so and good. soft and the geometric with the flow like that's where i think working with carolyn pushed me to think about those things yeah. Stunning, stunning, and a skirt. Yeah, I love so I love a knitted skirt. I was gonna say not your first. <laughs> yeah, so lovely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting Gorgeous. me talk about it. Of course. <laughs> what do you have, Naomi? Well, I made such a beeline for this because I remembered <laughs> this is what I was knitting when the lady cheered me up at the airport. Oh, amazing! <laughs> <laughs> not on. this one. A prototype. Okay, okay. Um, actually, the other version we have is the same one. I just redid the border. So this is the actual piece. So this was piece. the actual piece, except I um, I originally had a dark green border on it, not gray. But um, this is the second version. Oops. <laughs> we're we're just going to cover everything here this for is, a moment. Ta-da! Oh my god. This is the um, other one. Yeah, I'm just going to bring um, this up as you're chatting. Tell so us about it. So this is called the Beachcomber Shawl, and... Um, I was knitting it as a yeah mindless meditative um, stockinette, well no garter so just knit stitch um, wrap while I was back home on that that trip um, the first time I went back in several years after the pandemic and um, where I go where I visit in the UK is coastal um, and I was just inspired by the textures of the the sand and the, the very these very characteristic ridges in the sand that you get with like really um, tidal areas it has like I forget the geographic name for like I knew what you mean super the low, they have like really low tides dense. and really high tides yeah. it's that part of the coast where the, the low tide is super low and the high tide is super high and you get these vast expanses of very interesting beach when you have that kind of movement Nothing and there's a lot of seaweed this. so <laughs> and the old shale this lace pattern is, is very characteristic of the knitting tradition where where my family is from. So all around, that was sort of like a bunch of beachy inspiration. So lovely. What a story. Um, and I really like the shape of it. It's um, got that classic V vibe of the hand knit shawls that we're really familiar with, but I don't love fully symmetrical triangle shawls. Um, I like a bit of asymmetry. I like a sort of interesting quirky shaping. And I, I really like, just from a practical side, I really like scarves. Just a lot of long fabric that you can wrap around and around rather than just ending up with little tails at your neck. <laughs> well, also, I think this is such a good illustration of how, where color choice mm -hmm. and yarn choice make a totally different make a garment. Such a, so, so, like, this has moments of Stephen Westian sort of <laughs> intensity, yeah. right? Versus the yeah. original inspiration was this very sort of monochromatic sand yeah. inspired thing yeah. I know I'm going down the hole mm -hmm. thank you for sharing your gorgeous <laughs> story but I'm so like distracted <laughs> by this is this the same yarn as it, the it is okay yes. so it's color changing it's yeah. yeah it's the Zauberwola it's the Zauberwola DK so you use the same color mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. stripes and, in, and the um, border mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you use a different color just in the central panel and then a third color for the wings and then this one just same three colors same, it's alpaca yeah, she, uh, from San Nisgarn. Yeah. yeah but then here yeah. it's just all one yeah, yeah. yeah. same like it's the yeah. equivalent to this part this is I picked up yarn for this when we were at the knitting loft because I'm really into the <laughs> idea of having like souvenir projects in the book from every place that we visit with it so I picked up um, spin cycle <laughs> love spin cycle <laughs> Mm -hmm. and a slightly lighter fingering weight yarn so I think the, the version I'm going to be knitting I use the same size needle but it's going to still be a bit smaller yeah that's this is the um the 2024 project I think that we're both interested in is having for ourselves one of each thing from the book to wear and to have it be ours because okay. these really belong to the mm -hmm. store and to the book and they go on tour so like what what are the versions that we have in our own wardrobe? Because that was a big part of designing the collection. It's like, well, I want all these things. <laughs> I want to have all of these. This is the problem. Okay, so what have you chosen as a favorite? Okay. First of all, loving the shawl. This is what I feel like I've started to become a, a shawl girl. Because you can wear them in so many different ways. Like, even the way you were wearing it with the little um, angle, yeah. angular triangle at the front. I've got it as a cross. 
so many options. Okay, so distracted. <laughs> um, I chose my favorite, and it, it's always hard to choose, especially because I'm such a spatial visual person. I can envision anything, and trust me, what's on the rack beside me, which you will get a B-roll of, is stunning, but I always think I'm like, ooh, what colors <laughs> could I use? What could I, how could I put my little, like, pears roll knitting on? Um, little touch, but I chose it. Gorgeous. Tell me about this and what it does it have a name? It does. This is the gala sweater. And this is a hand knit reworking of a um, of a piece that I did in my I, I did a uh, master's degree in knitwear design in um <laughs> <laughs> Pardon. We haven't even got that there yet. <laughs> it exists going. Uh-huh. in uh, the Scottish borders. Um, it was a year-long program, and um, one of my modules was um, inspired by workwear um, traditionally worn mostly by by women factory workers in textile factories, and this um, these really interesting contrasts, both from like archival photos, but also just like visiting the factories themselves, of these really intense, heavy, big, clunking machines producing these beautiful sheer lacy types of fabric and um i did a sweater with in a sort of hearty rustic yarn with a cashmere lace panel and um so this is when the... i was designing for the book my granny was always like that that was her favorite thing i think from the collection that i that she saw and she's like you need to make that pattern and so i was inspired by that and so the um but the, the sort of color and texture inspiration is more playful and um, celebratory. Gala is the nickname of the town where I was, but also makes me think of like street parties and bunting and that kind of thing. So that's sort of what, what this panel is making me think. Oh, it's so This also uses gorgeous. that make it tweed that we yeah, absolutely love. Right. And it's yeah. in every other. Every other. So it's held yeah. with mohair in every other stripe. Yeah. And then the plain stripe is just the fingering weight on its own. And then in the body, you're holding mohair and fingering weight together. It's such a stunning combination. Visually, of course, with like the uh, mohair halo with mm. it. But I mean, it's gorgeous. Well, one fabric. of the things I really like, we call this a little bit the. Um, this is in the front party in the back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The it's sweater. the mullet sweater. It's understated front. Yeah. Where the back is, mm-hmm. is the, the part- show piece. Absolutely. And I think that's really nice that for a change of pace, right? Yeah. Have you heard the term coffin sweater? Tell me, no. I don't it just, know. It's where, like, the, there's only patterning on the front. It's like, I don't know, remember where I read it, but I think it was from the blogosphere. It's like, I don't like these coffin sweaters, like, where, like, there's intense cabling and whatever on the front of the sweater, but the back is plain. As you like, well, that's only going to look good when you're in the coffin. But then the, on the other hand, not having intense cabling on the back of a sweater or bobbles, I can understand when you try to sit. Yeah. Um, but so this is the reverse. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. And for me, it's all, I think as many knitters, we love the details. Like this. Oh, the keyhole neckline. Yeah. Can we, can we appreciate There's a lot color? of eye cord in this one. <laughs> I love eye cord. I'm an eye cord girl. It's pretty fun. Totally. I should have got one of those crank things. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, spin cycle, my dear. Do they, they make have they have they have something? Oh, cool. And oh, that, yeah, tools. yeah. Yeah. There's like I think it's, it's a hand one. Yeah. I cord tools are having a moment. Yeah. For sure. Right they now. They did not exist when I made this. I had to do my eye cord by hand. Yeah. Okay. I'm in love with everything. I'm so excited <laughs> to be drooling with video after. So I think finishing off with the element of joy, perhaps, and it doesn't have to be strictly outside of knitting. It can be anything. What currently is bringing you sheer joy right now? My cat's been really cute lately. <laughs> <laughs> We've been away a little bit. Yes. We were, um, my husband was away for a week on business. I went away for a weekend. Then we went like on our very belated honeymoon. And ever since then, we, so we were away for like... Congratulations. <laughs> but the house was totally empty for like a chunks of January and February and like she's really my husband's cat like she feels his absence a lot more she's just been like kind of a little more cuddly and vocal lately and it's been really cute <laughs> that's lovely that's so that very cute. cute that's lovely I'll show you a picture after okay we'll do we'll do a little chat and chat and insta yeah um I would say uh my I have a nine-year-old daughter yeah. and around Christmas time she asked if we could have more family time 
together. Which are like, okay. <laughs> you two are the and, sweetest people. Um, so we now have like after dinner we play games. And only one day of the week is that allowed to be video games, although those are super fun too. Mm-hmm. But just um, always loved games, always loved cards, grew up in a family that did not. So I was like the lonely only child to be like, does anybody want to play cards? <laughs> and now I have my own family that <laughs> loves to play cards. So um, that's one of my favorite things right now is that like the dinner dishes go in the kitchen we don't do them right away we sit down and we play a board game or we play cards or word games um the three of us and it's been super fun and i really look forward to it every day you know it's cute right the super cute cute. like super cute connections with kitty (laughs) and your family yeah it's too it's too good um what about you what's bringing me joy lately yeah i have to say i know this is so so surface but um I'd have to say running again. Oh, no, it's not surface. Okay, Ooh. so, well, um, because I got into running pandemic E, uh, not going to the gym, became, I classify myself as a runner, again, like a knitter, and I couldn't run while in Mexico for a full month for different reasons, just where we were staying, the crazy, dangerous cobblestone streets. Yeah. I would have broke my ankle. And I think kind of that weird sense of I don't know fear not fear but like worry that I would come back to Toronto and have to start from scratch doing like a 1k run and we're back at it and it's bringing me great joy and uh, always with me with the thing that I do and I love is the people as well so I'm back running in the city with my running bestie and it's just it's a delight I look forward to it every time so yeah (laughs) Um, I want to thank you so much. There's going to be noise, so hold, hold the horses here. What? One moment. Yes, okay. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast with me today. And as a thank you, I have little mitts that I, that I knit up for Shit. each of you. This is a design I'm coming up with. Currently being tested, probably by the time the video comes out, the pattern will be out. These are Faber Fingerless Mitts. And you are already my thief. <laughs> <laughs> it's my first design. It's just these are the fun. sweetest. So, sweet. so thank you. Oh, just thank a little, you. Like, little gift of thank you. Look at the proportion of that. It's perfect. You think that these things don't need a design? They really do because, like, the thoughtful little details of fit on, on also, something like, so simple. You made and these you made for us. This. And I forgot I my mitts today, and I needed some. <laughs> Okay, my dating heart is just overjoyed. So, Did you get the color you wanted? Yes. Okay. I really picked <laughs> out based on I feel like both of your sets. Yes, yeah. So, oh, color these were intended. Fit. You have the small. I couldn't tell. And then Seth, okay. you have oh, medium. Oh, beautiful. Okay, I get it. Yeah, you I could tell perfect. if you took the right pair. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. Okay. One place in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strictly. So, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And, like, I will now. Remember every time I wear these, I'm gonna remember oh, this day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's really, really lovely. Oh, so Thank cozy. you. Love Thank it. you. Of course, my pl- absolute pleasure. And of course, um, we have a book for your viewers. <gasps> yes. Wait. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. Yeah, this we- is the best. Okay. So we will get into details okay, um, if you are interested in having one of these gorgeous knitting books, knits from the LYS, from these two gorgeous humans. I'm just gonna ask that you subscribe, obviously, to the channel if you have not and leave a comment you can comment about perhaps anything especially co or anything we talked about what yeah, was interesting absolutely. to you absolutely um yeah we just ran our very first giveaway this will be giveaway number two Wonderful. good luck everybody i'm so excited um with that being said if you enjoyed today's podcast this episode um i invite you to like and subscribe and if you are so willing um, to venture down into the little what the box below um, and possibly consider making a donation on my Ko-Fi account to purchase a coffee. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you big time Thank to you. Stephanie and Naomi yeah. from Miss Basti Co and co-authors of Knits from the LYS. Until next time, I hope knitting brings you great joy. Take care.